Um, I'm Kara Feldman Hunt. I'm the program manager for UVM Integrative Health, and this is the Integrative Practitioner Forum. This is a series that we hold about five to six sessions um, an academic year. We do offer continuing education credits for this series. You can go onto My Credits if you go onto the UVM website and you want to claim credit. Um, we have parking passes in the back. You can grab one if you parked in the garage. And there are two handouts on that back table. One is just other upcoming events. One is for the Society for Acupuncture Research um, meeting that we're hosting here at UVM. So if you're interested in that, grab that on your way out. Um, let's see, what else did I want to tell you? We are recording up until the, the sort of last third. So just so you know, this is, is being recorded. Um, and our next forum is on January 9th. Um, this will be presented by Clayton English, who's a pharmacist. And he's going to talk about, his title is Beyond Opioids, um, Non-Controlled Pharmaceuticals for the Management of Chronic Pain. And he's a great speaker. So join us for that. Um, tonight I have three speakers. And rather than me telling so much about you all, maybe when you come up, you could just do a quickie, brief introduction of yourselves. So I'm not just reading from the paper, if that's OK. And I'm apologizing in advance. This is a, a very highly technical evening. So I'm going to be bopping up and down and just be patient with us as we switch in between things. And don't laugh at me if um, you know I'm struggling. <laughs> Jay, yeah. why don't you come on up? So you're all set up right now. I don't know how to flip, though. Oh, you can um, use this. The magic wand. Did that work? Yes. Nice. Whew. OK, we but gotta we got to go, go back. back. Does that go back? Yeah. The magic wand. Don't awesome. lose the magic wand. Right. We need that. OK. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Jay Gleason. Uh, and at the risk of looking like a dork, like my daughter says, I'm going to wear these migraine glasses because I have daily chronic migraines. I've had them for years. After thousands of dollars spent on treatment, these little rose-colored glasses actually help. So I'm just going to wear them and look like a dork, if you don't <laughs> mind. Um, I'm, I've been a, a psychotherapist since um, 1998 when I graduated from UVM. Got trained in a bunch of uh, mindfulness and somatic um, uh, you know, modalities, including EMDR. Um, about I'm going to say like 12 years ago. Anyone know Bryn Perkins? She happens to be here. Yeah, so I'm seeing Bryn as a client, and um, she, she pulls this book off her desk and, and is like, um, you need to deeply unwind. Maybe this will help you. So I start doing TRE for a couple years, and then I get trained in it, and then they want me to get trained more, and then they want me to get trained more, and they wanted me to become a certification trainer, which means I certify other, other uh, clinicians. Um, and then uh, in, in, in 2012, I went to massage school and became an Asian, Asian body work therapist. Um, and I've been doing that in my practice. So combining everything is kind of fun. Um, I think that's enough about me. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to talk about TRE, which, um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you what it is. I'm going to tell you the history of it. I'm going to talk about the therapeutic benefits of tremors that come from external sources and the potential therapeutic benefits of uh, tremors that come from inside us. Um, and then I'm going to show you some video, hopefully, <laughs> about what, what they look like or could look like. And then I'm going to talk about the research. And I'm going to do that all in 20 minutes. <laughs> Go. Go. <laughs> OK. So TRE stands for Attention and Trauma Releasing Exercises. It's a series of seven exercises that helps the body release deeply held tension. By deep, I mean close to the spine. For you body workers, I mean the deep front line, primarily. It does this by evoking a natural uh, response of shaking or tremoring or vibrating. Um, so in yoga, everyone, anyone do yoga, you know, if I stood here for like five minutes, I would begin to tremor, right? Uh, if I did Qigong and stayed here, I would begin to tremor. In yoga, they call it the uh, the sacred tremor. Anyone know what bars is? 
I don't know what bars is, but I've had people come and talk to me about bars and be like, oh, I do that in bars. I'm like, oh, that's, I gotta check this out. Um, so under duress, the human organism and all mammals will tremor. Ever been so mad you shook? Ever been so excited you shook? Right? Women shake during and after childbirth. Um, in theory, what we do is we take people in a non-distress state and stretch muscles, fatigue <clears throat> muscles, activate the tremor response, and now we're getting to, we think, habitual contraction patterns. Does that make sense? It might not yet. So the goal with TRE is to tremor without trying. What we used to call it I, I couldn't stand it. We used to call it self-induced therapeutic tremors. And all that did is scare people. Self-induced therapeutic tremors. That just sounds crazy, doesn't it? Now we call it neurogenic tremors, which is what we called it 10 years ago. Um, it was developed by uh, Dr. David Berselli. He's a traumatologist. He, um, he, uh, he's got a PhD <laughs> in social work research, three master's degrees, speaks some languages, including Arabic. He's been in the military, was an attendant to Mother Teresa's, trained in, tra trained in bioenergetics, trained as a body worker. And in the 1980s, he was doing trauma work in, in, uh, in uh, Beirut, in the Middle East. And what he noticed is that whenever something, whenever the humans were under duress, there was a bomb that was going off, we all contracted in a similar way. Pulled ourselves in, into a fetal position. If someone were to walk in and go, yay, we would all go, oh. but we would contract in this manner. And he surmised that if the body naturally does this, there must be a way that it releases that contraction na naturally. It just doesn't make evolutionary sense. If we're just going to do this, how do we release that contraction? So that's one bit of theory. And um, he noticed that, well, the story he tells us, he's in a bomb shelter. He's got two children on his lap. Bombs are going off, the kids are shaking, but none of the adults are. And he goes and he talks to the adults. Did you want to shake? And they're like, yes, but we didn't want the kids to know that we were afraid. And he noticed the kids over time were staying resilient. And the adults were getting more and more debilitated. One thing led to another, and he came up with these seven exercises that for most people will um, start the tremors within a few minutes. In fact, most of the time I just do one exercise with people. And they tremor. Um, Anyone know Dan Siegel? Yeah. Right. Uh, anyone know this? Dan Siegel's hand? Yeah. Okay. So, if this is the body, this is the basic theory of TRE in all somatic interventions, right? It's simplified. We got the body, we got the brain stem, limbic system, the emotional parts of the brain, we got the thinking parts of the brain, the medial prefrontal cortex. When we release tension from the body, it sends a message up to the brain stem and the limbic system probably through the vagus and the fascial system, to down-regulate the stress response. When the stress response is down-regulated, now I can think myself through my problems. That's bottom-up processing. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's move into tremors now. Uh, oh, boy. Did it work? Yes. Okay. When I feel safe, I vibrate in a certain way, right? My voice sounds a certain way. I actually hear in a certain way. My heart rate's certain. Peristalsis is a certain way. Um, breath, circulation. If my paraequiductal gray, which is in the temporal lobe, senses some kind of danger, I'm going to contract and my pulsation will change. If my paraequiductal gray in the temporal lobe thinks that I'm in, in a life-threatening situation, I will freeze and dissociate, right? What, tier, what the neuroscientists tell us about TRE, or the tremor mechanism, is that it's actually the freeze discharge. We're discharging the freeze, the contraction that has to do with freeze. And we're going to contract in a very specific way along... Oh, one more. Um, along the deep front line. And this doesn't show the deep front line, and it also adds the biceps. But the deep front line, anyone here, um, Thomas Myers? People know Thomas Myers? 
must be a body. Yeah. Anatomy traits, right? This is right from anatomy traits. So the deep front line, and this is where the tremors start. Deep front line starts at the bottom of the foot, deep into the calf, comes up into the adductors, pelvic floor, psoas iliacus, quadratus lumborum, diaphragm, anterior longitudinal ligament, comes all the way up, under uh, pericardium around the heart, pleura around the lungs, underneath the sternum, larynx, pharynx, terminates at the masseter, the tongue, and the temporalis. That's all one line of pull. Now, if you notice, this line of pull has to do with walking, breathing, and talking, or relationships. Bessel van der Kolk says that three ways that humans regulate, he adds touch and a couple other things, are moving, interoception, which has to do with breath or body awareness, and relationship, which has to do with talking. If we influence this line, we're probably influencing uh, emotional regulation. Plus, it goes around the pericardium and the heart. Anyone know Stephen Porges? Yes. What? Are, what? are you like a psychiatrist or something? What? Uh, all right, so. Polyvagal uh, theory, right? What? The polyvagal. polyvagal theory. Right, so the polyvagal theory tells us that if we regulate the heart, we regulate emotion. Darn. Every, every emotion has a specific cardiac output, bronchial output, and prosodic output, quality of voice. Okay. Oh, I'm probably going over time already. Um, okay. So the idea with trauma treatment is um, in trauma, the neocortex, the medial prefrontal cortex, is going to be hijacked by the limbic system in the brainstem. This is way too simplistic, but I think you get the idea. So we need, we need treatments that are going to speak the language of the limbic system in the brainstem. Yeah? And TRE, we, we think that TREs are, TRE, uh, the tremors are coming from the brainstem. The latest thinking is that they're coming from central pattern generators in the spine, which are these gizmos in the spine. I'll talk more about in a sec. Okay, so now we're going to look at tremors. So in the field of psychology, um, tremors are associated with disorder. Usually the anxiety disorders and PTSD. In the medical field, there's 10 different types of tremors associated with disease. But the physical therapists figured something out. In the 1960s, they started using these gizmos that shake the body externally. And they found improving condition of joints. And in the 70s, with their gymnasts, they used these gizmos that shake people. And that had a positive effect on athletic performance. And then in the 90s, we start to get all these benefits from external shaking, improved range of motion, coordination of the musculoskeletal system and nervous system, increased rate of healing injuries, increased bone density, pain. Uh, anyone a member at the YMCA here? Yes, I knew I knew you from someplace. Right, so you know the power plate at the Y? So they have this gizmo at the Y, right? It's, it's like this big, and you stand on it, kneel on it, sit on it, and it just vibrates. You have different buttons, and it vibrates strong, and then it vibrates soft, and it's all of this, right? Interestingly enough, you know who uses it the most? It's not the Y members. It's the personal trainers. Yeah. Okay, we don't want that. The tremors that we, um, that, that TRE induces is different in four ways. One. We can get the tremors through posture. If I stood here for five minutes, I would probably be, well, I can tremor just to stand. If we just stood here, I would begin to tremor. I could also tremor through deep relaxation. We can get it both ways. Other tremors, it's not like this. They either happen when you're doing something or when you're at rest. Um, the tremors that we start, they will be augmented at rest. They will take their next step once we start a postural tremor, get in a relaxed position, now the tremor will kind of move into its next stage. They will move throughout the body. In seconds, minutes, they'll move throughout the body. Uh, other tremors may move throughout the body, but it might take weeks, months, years, not minutes. They vary in amplitude and frequency, so they can be fast and short or big and slow and long. 
and you'll see um, you'll see this when I show you the videos. If the, I show you the videos, okay. It's thought that these tremors are coming from something called uh, central pattern generators. And these are neural networks that produce movements, rhythmic movements. So you ever see a baby come out of the womb in water? It knows how to swim, central pattern generator. And also there's, there's uh, central pattern generators that have to do with walking. They, we don't need um, communication from the brain to make some of these movements, right? So there's no, there's no efferent motor signal from the brain to these central pattern generators. But there are afferent signals, meaning coming from the spinal cord up to the brain, and they go to the limbic system, and uh, the, which is kind of the threat-sensitive parts of the brain. Parts of the brain that have to do with interoception, proprioception, and contraction. Now we know with interoception, with, what's interoception? Come on, interoception. Right, interoception, body awareness, with kindness, right? body awareness. Russell Van der Kolk says interoception is where we need to go with people who are traumatized, but it's the last place they want to go. Because right. this is so scary. I don't even know if that mic's That did make a noise. So, uh, in proprioception, where I am in space. If you have a client who is dissociated or dissociating in your office, Put them on one foot and throw a ball at them. You can't be dissociated in balance and relate to someone throwing a ball. Boom. Proprioception. Uh, so all this, and then habitual contraction patterns, changes in neurology, all this we can potentially increase emotional regulation. Okay. There's another function to tremors, and I don't really explain this well, but I'm going to do my best. Um, do people know what uh, procedural memories are? Procedural memories are body-based memories. They're the least conscious memories we have. They're memories we don't know we're having. Um, uh, so my mom used to chew carrots really loud. It used to drive me crazy. Like, and even today, I get around my mother and she chews carrots and I'm like, Ugh! and I'm like, that makes no sense. Given my mom and I, that makes no sense. Right? I suspect there's some kind of fight response that's somehow encoded in that. Remember, these are memories we don't know we're having. So how this works is, let's say I get in a, a minor car accident, but enough so that my push doesn't save me. Does that make sense? So I actually hit the steering wheel. Really scary. But my pectoral muscles didn't save me. Then what could happen is that the body holds that contraction. And that contraction does two things. One, it sends a message up to the brain that I'm in danger, I'm not safe. And two, it sends a message up that this thing that happened, this car accident, is still happening. And then I walk around my life, and I'll, because this is contracted, this starts to hurt, right? And then, oh, I gotta pull myself back up so my lower back starts to hurt. Then the psoas contracts and I get this sort of crunching of the back. Now I have lower back pain. And now I have sciatica because it's going down, it's going down my leg, because it's in my glutes. What happens with TRE, what we think happens, is that the muscles that didn't save me begin to contract and release. And when they release, that sends a message up that I'm safe. It also sends a message to the brain, we think, that this thing that happened, happened there and then, not here and now. It's no longer imminent. That's called integration. It's stuck in the timeline of our lives. I don't really explain that well, but that's the psychobabble if you want to read it. I won't read it to you. This is Bob Scare. He wrote a lovely book on dissociation. Does anyone know it? I can't remember. Um, the Body Bears a Burden? That's correct. Yeah? Is that it? <laughs> And he wrote a, oh, okay, so this is what they look like. So let me go back. Uh, let me go back. Uh, hello? Okay, now let's go forward. Okay, this is what, well, you gotta do the video. Okay. Yeah. No, in addition. So when people begin to tremor, this is kind of what it will look like. Let's let this play a little bit. Okay. So you can see how we got primarily tremors in the adductors, right? I don't know when this guy starts going, because usually they go at the same time. 
But his tremors look, look similar. David sends, is trying to show, show that these are low frequency, longer waves. I can't tell much difference still. But now I'm going to show, oh, there he is. I mean, he's a little bigger. So that's a muscle release. Muscles are releasing tension there. And then if we go to the other videos, bow to the technological bods. You can do it. We can do this. You got this. We fit. You got this. Um. Yes. <laughs> you do art first. This one? Yeah. Okay. Because we don't need to start on a certain place. Okay, this is my buddy Art from San Diego, but it's not playing. Now it is. Okay. So this is a fascia release. You see how it's gripping the body? It's changing the structure of the body. Now remember, people who get traumatized don't want to feel the body. But if you can the body, you know, the knees, I can get the hands very comfortable. Not the greatest video I can see on a phone. Uh, he had a, a pretty serious head injury, so the provider is kind of a head. And you can see how he goes over to one side. A little bit of a freeze response here. Not associated with the and he goes to the other side. If he goes to one side, it all, always goes to the other side. This guy's trying to walk here. And here's the release of the tension. You see how that looks different? Let's go to the next one. Alright, we're gonna try to start it at 222 maybe. Yeah. Um because you can do it. If not, we can start right from the beginning. I think it's already there. Okay. I don't think so, but that's okay. Just play. No, no this is from the beginning. Oh. Okay, so this is me. This was about 10 years ago. And this is da actually David Berselli, the guy who, um, who developed here. And as a provider, he's not really doing much. What he's watching for is I would kind of freeze up here, and then the tension would come out my legs. There it comes out my legs. But the, the, I can't start this video where I wanted to start it, so it's going to be a little while. Give me one second. I think we can. No, just keep going. You sure? Yeah. Okay. We'll make it work. Right. I just want people to get a flavor of what can happen. Totally comfortable, like no pain whatsoever. Mm -hmm. He asked me, where are you feeling it? Mm -hmm. And I was feeling tension up here. So. Now, because the fascial trains move throughout the body, I'm actually releasing <coughs> tension this tension in the leg, superficial back line, starts at the bottom of the foot, comes all the way up, and terminates at the middle of the forehead. How am I doing on time? I gotta stop. Yeah. Okay. Stop. Maybe if we have time after, we okay. can watch more of it. Is yeah. that cool? And uh, so I'll just do research really briefly. Okay. Um, um, go ahead. So we in the TRE community are poor. We don't have any money. Um, but someone got a grant for 500 grand, and the VA is studying it now in Phoenix. Yeah, right? Also, the Austrian army is studying it now for their service providers. Um, can we go to my, back to my thing? Yeah, can you go? This? Oh, I can go forward? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so there's been about 20 research studies done. Um, uh, a while ago, there was a huge study. They, they did TRE, among other things, with 8,000 active duty service members pre and post deployment. Got really good results. Um, the DOD owns the study, and according to the researcher that I talked with last week, they've sat on it. They haven't released it. They might have other things going on. I don't know. But it did get a mention in the Defense Centers of Excellence for Psychological Health and TBI book. I don't know if anyone's heard about this, but it's actually really good. And what they show, this is the Department of Defense. The evolving research indicates that body-based techniques like yoga, TRE, and traditional Chinese medicine may help regulate stress, blah, 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 blah. But that's not objective data. I like objective data. Did a, a small study, small N, uh, N of 28, did the TRE six times over two weeks, self-report, reduced anxiety, but what got me excited was heart rate variability 
um, changed in the desired direction. Heart rate variability, for lack of a better term, is a way, uh, is a measure of the health of the autonomic nervous system, which is to say how happy someone is. Um, I'm not going to get into that. I like objective data. Um, this was, uh, I talked to the researcher a couple of years ago, R Ricardo, great guy, um, really smart. Um, and what he found is he uh, did EEG recordings of brain waves while people were tremoring. And apparently, this, this green thing means that most of the brain is in an alpha state while tremoring. In an alpha state, is that meditative state, that relaxed state, that sort of well-being, that state of well-being. Other people might have other words to it. So that, that got me excited. Um, and uh, OK, that's all I got. So thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Awesome. Yeah. Kira, you are up. You can set up all Perfect. There's the wand. Okay, and teach yeah. me how to do the wand. Yep. So if you just hit um, this one, that oh will God. send you forward. Awesome. And you want a mic. I don't I know. I don't need it. Really? Was can it people? Up? Can you hear in the back if they don't use a mic? Okay. I don't know. Just if project. You're good. You're up. Hi. Oh yeah, I have a timer. I'm official. Uh, <laughs> my name is Kira Cryer. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. And I have been practicing in Burlington for 15 years. I've been a social worker for uh, a little over 20. I started off in DCF in Philadelphia and found my way here at UVM. And I am an EMDR therapist, which stands for Eye Movement Desensitization Reprocessing. And I am a certified therapist, so that means I went through a bunch of trainings to uh, really become an expert in EMDR. And I'm a consultant, which means I supervise other people who are practicing EMDR in their, as their therapist uh, modality. So what is EMDR? So eye movement desensitization reprocessing it's using bilateral stimulation. It's an integrative psychotherapy approach that has been extensively researched, proven to be effective for the treatment of trauma. It was tested out with um, the Veterans uh, Association. They have money to sort of test out theories and see what works. And EMDR is a set of standardized protocols. So there's a protocol for um, Working with someone who has been in a, a car accident, there's, been, there's a protocol for nightmares, there's all sorts of different protocols that incorporate elements from many different treatment approaches with the use of bilateral stimulation using eye movements, tones, or tapping. So eye movements is just like this. You're following, you're not moving your head, you're just moving your eyes. And the distance between therapist and client is two ships passing in the night, so knee to knee. Uh, if people are people with uh, significant trauma, sexual trauma, knee to knee is not uh, the suggested space. So to date, EMDR has helped millions of people of all ages relieve many types of psychological stress. Um, this is the definition. EMDR model is based on adaptive information processing, so our brains, that much of the psychopathology is due to the maladaptive encoding and or incomplete processing of a traumatic event or disturbing event. This impairs the client's ability to integrate these experiences in an adaptive manner. So who's a good for? Everybody, that's what I really wanted to say, but <laughs> I was like, all right, I'll break it down for everybody. So depression, other mood disorders, generalized anxiety, panic, phobias, PTSD, grief, um, sexual assault, domestic violence, emotional sexual abuse, addiction, somatic, you get the, uh, you get the idea. My specialty is uh, grief, loss, PTSD, uh, sexual domestic violence, uh, traumatic events, and first responders. That's uh, where I hone in on my practice. Um, I also work, at, I should have mentioned this in my introduction, I um, am the co-coordinator of a project and a program in the women's prison uh, that's looking at how domestic violence and sexual violence have 
impacted their lives and sent them on the pathway to incarceration. So the effectiveness, the research on EMDR, there's 20 control, controlled studies have consistently found EMDR effectively decreases or eliminates symptoms of PTSD for the majority of clients. This 2017 study just came out uh, about two weeks ago. I was so excited for this, but um, in 2017, four studies compared EMDR with the various different trauma-focused therapies, CBT uh, interventions, and three of those studies found greater efficacy in EMDR, less time needed. That was specific to working with children and adolescents. So research on effectiveness, um, EMDR is designated effective for PTSD, and this is just a little bit of, um, you know, references and how we how EMDR got so popular. Um, it was recognized by the World Health Organization and primarily the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs, which is where it was originally tested out on in the uh, 1980s. That's where it began began getting momentum. And Bezel van der Kolk, for those of you who don't know, he is sort of the guru god of trauma. He uh, is out of Harvard Medical Center in Boston. And he sort of is, as Jay mentioned, he sort of gives all of us of what's the next best thing for trauma work. So this is a technique. EMDR is a psychotherapy approach that is guided by the adaptive information processing model, the AIP and composed of integrative protocols procedures, which include the use of bilateral stimulation. There's eight phases, so in order to go through everything, I just shortened everything up to give you a little bit of what it is, and then give some case examples so people can really understand how it works. So there's eight phases. It's not like you just come in, sit down, and here I go. There's some history taking, preparation, assessment, stabilization, so making sure someone is stable, that they have good coping skills, that they can handle what's coming up. Um, and then looking at past, present, and futurizing. So looking at what in the past has influenced what's happening now and what is now influencing you. Um, and then how do we look at it in the future? So before you leave and you're done therapy, we're looking at if this happens again, how might you handle that? It, is, uh, it involves and incorporates cognitive behavioral, it's client-centered, it's mindfulness, you gotta be in tune with your body, and those questions are always coming up. Here's how it started. In 1987, uh, psychologist Francine Shapiro made the chance observation that eye movements can reduce the intensity of disturbing thoughts. Uh, this was her own experience. I had the pleasure of meeting her, and she had her own experience with cancer and was sitting by, she explained she was sitting by a, a body of water and she was watching a swan and thinking about her, uh, her cancer and what that meant for her. And she noticed that naturally she was calming down. And so she began this research. She studied the effect scientifically and in 1989 she reported <coughs> success using EMDR to treat victims of trauma. Um, that's part of the VA. Since then, EMDR has developed, evolved through contributions of therapists and researchers all over the world. Uh, today, EMDR is a set of standardized protocols. So my supervisor, his name, his name is Mark Nickerson, and he trains me and then supervised me, and he just recently released a book on working with first responders. So, and that's the second, his first book was about working with veterans and uh, coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq. So, the, the therapists alone are helping it move forward by their own research and experience. So this gives you a little bit of an idea of what I mean by the AIP model. When a traumatic or disturbing event happens, the natural system for the processing of memory has been interrupted because of the high arousal. Like when we rise up and we can't always focus when we're risen up and or the encoded survival information, so fight, flight, freeze response. The information that occurs at the time of the upsetting event is stuck or frozen, right? We like do this. And present day triggers or experience can activate the feelings and responses in that. Negative thoughts, intrusive, physical sensations. I'm gonna flip through, because I have a little case example for that, what that might look like. So 
So generally speaking, for individuals who are psychologically healthy and have more sense of their selves, a new experience is taken in. You sort through it in terms of what's useful, learned, right? Like an event happens. If you've never had an event happen before, so let's take, um, so if you're in a car accident if, and you've never had any other experience with a car accident, you might be able to process that with no problems. There's no traumatic event. But then for another individual who might have already been in a car accident, had a traumatic event in their life involving a car accident or heard stories about car accidents, their psychological health is different than the person who only had one incident with that. So then they have to sort through their emotional responses to that event. So if you've had multiple car accidents, you're gonna have more intrusive thoughts, more physical sensations, more negative emotions, more thoughts of, what if that was me? What if I'm gonna die? Maybe I'm gonna die. Maybe it's not safe to be in a car. All of that sort of stuff starts to come in. <clears throat> so traumatization, I think most people, again, like we're, we're always going to quote Bezel. <laughs> he's just, a, he's amazing at what he does. Uh, the traumatization, what that means is it's been described as a disruption of the inherent processing. Because when something happens that's abnormal, there's an interrupt, right? The, the body is like, <gasps> and freezes and goes into fight mode. It can freeze mode and it can flee, like run. So, these are the ways that traumatization occurs in our brain. Under nor normal circumstances, information's processed, talk, expressive, artistic, daydreaming, even, even dreaming at night, which we're gonna talk about a little bit. In trauma, however, the malfunction of this is the information processing system occurs such that the experience of the trauma remains frozen. So the car accident happens and you keep seeing it over and over again. Every time you get in the car, you feel the sensation of it, right? It keeps going. When a traumatic event occurs, it's locked or frozen in the brain. Original pictures, sounds, thoughts, feelings, body sensations, present day experiences can trigger those original thoughts and feelings. We know that all the time. You're walking down the hallway and you smell someone and you're like, oh my gosh, he smells like my grandfather, right? That is what a trigger is. Traumatic events can occur the same way. It can flash just like that for you. EMDR helps process the frozen <coughs> stuff, the information that allows the brain to process the experience by connecting the old or stuck memory. So with other information in your brain. So relating something that might have happened way back here, which is why you're having a response to it now. So similar to what might happen in rapid eye movement, which is where some of the studies came from in sleep, when we dream, we actually process in our sleep naturally, rapid eye movement. The eye movements or other forms of bilateral stimulation may help to process the unconscious information stored in your brain. Does that make sense for everybody? So <clears throat> another example of this would be a child who's learning to swim may have the experience of an adult holding them above water and then let them go, resulting in the child going underwater. Child's fine. Child learns how to swim. Everything's great. The adult then ho takes hold of them and brings them to the surface and the child begins to cry, but the adult comforts. Everything is reassured. The child is okay. They learn that they're okay in the face of fear. However, for another child, the distress of the event does not resolve. Continual anxiety suggests that the information processing system has stored their experience without a resolution. They feel fear. The child cannot recall how much fun they were having in the water, and the adult really was there to support them. They don't remember that. They remember the fear of the water. Describing. <clears throat> so really just trying to get to the describing what it's like to be in EMDR, it does not take away the memory. You're always gonna remember what happened, but it softens it. That's the, the greatest word that I can use for it is it's take something that feels like it's wrecking your whole system and you're thinking about it all the time and it just softens it. You will remember it, but it'll be more distant, vague, and not as distressing. 
EMDR will not take any information that is valid or true that you need to hold on to for your well-being. So if you have, to, if you're in a domestic violence situation and you feel like um, you're not safe, we're not going to be changing anything if you're still in that domestic violence situation. You're still not going to feel safe. We can't change what's not true, what is true, sorry. It's your brain doing the healing. You're the one in control. I say this all the time to clients. I'm your facilitator of your change. I'm watching this happen. So access the dysfunctional stored information. Then we're going to stimulate the brain by bilateral. Move the information, desensitize it, and reprocess. Learning takes place. The client adapts to the understanding of the event that happened, and it shifts from the negative to the, cognition, to the positive cognition. So I'm not safe to I can be safe, right? Or I'm gonna die to I might die at some point, but I'm safe right now. To I'm not worthy to I am worthy. So client internally generates corrective information. So I don't do any of this. this I am just doing this, <laughs> or the bilateral stimulation. Uh, this comes naturally because you have it in your brain. You have that you are a good person in your brain. So the corrective information comes on its own. The therapist, I don't reflect, interpret, reframe, intervene in any traditional way. So it's a silent process. The client is centered, follow the client's, pro I'm following, I'm watching the body, because the body also gives us information. So if someone's processing something, and all of a sudden they start crying, I'm, I'm watching that to make sure that they're not going into something that might trigger them even more, or just being mindful of where they're at. And the language that I use all the time is the same, so that people aren't surprised. Just go with that, just notice that. Cognitive interweaves, uh, taken from cognitive behavioral therapy, is asking questions that link statements made by the client and only when needed to make the processing go forward. So if someone's stuck or they're looping through the same memory over and over again, it's just giving that, where else have you felt that in your life? So that they can you know, come to their own understanding of it. Processing sessions. So about 50 minutes, 45, 51, sometimes an hour, you know, if time goes over. A targeted memory can require more than one session. So number for processing sessions are varied, particular to the person and what traumatic event um, they've had. Typically, the studies show that one to four processing sessions for a single trauma. So I had a young girl, uh, she was 17 years old. She was on, she was on uh, the highway when an accident happened and she'd never seen anything else before, never had anything before. She came in, she felt traumatized by it because she, she was breaking curfew. So there was like some trauma about, I'm gonna break curfew. Oh my gosh, I can't believe this. She, she came four sessions. She had an instant of like fear that she was gonna be in trouble, that she might get hurt, and that was it, four sessions. Processing may or may not continue after session. So when you activate the brain bilaterally, when you leave the office, things can still arise. You can still process things. Uh, you can, you know, your brain is activated to start thinking about how did you get to this place of not feeling safe. <clears throat> Always targeting past, present, and future to get a resolution. How am I doing? So this is, um, just examples of uh, clients who have come in with certain things. So this is, um, oh, so this is a man who came in, and the human resources director came into his cubicle and tells him he has 15 minutes to clear out. Like he he's got to go his desk, download his computer files before he exit. This was a layoff. It's not like he did something wrong. It was just a layoff. His negative cognition is I'm worthless. So. He's feeling worthless because he was told uh, you have to get out right, this uh, right away. He also had some other messages within his lifetime, uh, particularly with a teacher of you're never going to make it. You're not going to amount to anything. So he already had that back here in his past, and this was his current. The positive connect uh, cognition, always having a positive in the same conversation, I have value. And then Validity is important with EMDR, so there's always a scale. Even for people who don't like scales, I try to ask them the scale anyway. So what is, when you're looking at I'm worthless, 
How bothersome does that feel to you on a scale of zero to 10? If 10 is the worst, that's where we're starting. Where do you feel it in your body? Connecting mind to body, right? Where do you feel that? What are the emotions that are coming? Is it irritable? Is it in your throat? Is it in your back? Where is that? And then looking at the same thing with the positive cognition. I have value on a scale of one to seven. How much do you believe that you have value right now in this moment? Three. He knows that he has some value, okay? So in that processing, you're, you're trying to get to the place of everything is at a zero. So the sud comes down, he now feels worth, worthy, he can go get a job. These are things that are shifting through his process. <clears throat> this is a childhood trauma example. My father appears at the bedroom door late at night, tells me to take off my clothes, I'm about five years old, smells of alcohol. So unfortunately, this, is, this sort of picture or image that people start with is fairly familiar for people who are adults who have experienced childhood trauma, that there's some sort of image of the person, and that's what you want them to hold in their head. And what is the negative cognition about that? I'm in danger. So in making sure the negative cognition can shift too, right? That you can be safe because father's not gonna appear in your door right now and also you're not five years old. So that, that's why it can be that. And how much do you feel I'm in danger? Eight out of 10. Because that showed up in her life in every relationship. Oh, look, I'm done. So in every relationship she was struggling with that. So just being aware that like you're, you're, the idea is to process the negative belief and shift it into the positive. And you do, you do all of that on your own just with the modality of bilateral stimulation. Here's quickly, how does it work? 2001, she wrote uh, this textbook. Uh, the best for me is the bottom one by analogy, although it took decades to discover why penicillin works, it was used in the meantime because it has positive effects were dramatic and reliable. So more, this is 2001, it's 2018, there's more and more studies of how effective this is. One of the greatest things um, that I love about being an EMDR therapist is every time that I go for a certification or more uh, CEUs, I have to participate in EMDR. And so that keeps me fresh. It keeps me knowing how much it works. Here's the, the short answer of why, because we didn't have a lot of time, but REM, it was studied through the REM sleep patterns and using bilateral stimulation shifts. These are the resources. And so just quickly, just to tell you a story, another sort of client story, I'm gonna tell one about myself that just recently happened. So in September, which at the end of September typically is a, not a great time of year for me. I, when I was in my 20s, I was engaged and he unfortunately passed away. And um, on a, that was, the anniversary was on a Monday. On Friday, I was meeting a, a new colleague at Scout Bakery in downtown Burlington. And we walk in, I've never met him. We're sitting down, we're talking. And within three minutes, a car came crashing through, right through right behind him, I'm grabbing him, pulling him this way. That happened. So that's on a Friday. Saturday morning, I was like, oh yeah, I'm not good. <laughs> I am definitely not good. I had all these thoughts, because what happened after that is there was only four, pe four or five people in the cafe. <coughs> so this man who I just met, ha him and I have to run to the guy who's having a seizure in the car and pull him out, and the building's starting to like crumble a little bit. So I knew right away, like I had this thought right away of uh, people just die in front of me. Like, I don't know what it is. I've seen, like people just die in front of me and what the heck, like, and I was so upset I was not sleeping and I called a colleague of mine and I was like, I need EMDR. I need EMDR right away. And so the following Friday, I went and saw him. I had not slept during the week. I was up with nightmares. I was up reliving my own tragedy of my fiance passing away and also feeling like, why? Why does this have to, you know, everybody goes through this. Why, why me, all that? That was even happening to me. Even though I have all the skills. I went, I was saw my friend. I had a 45 minute session and I walked out with, I am light. I am at all these people's dying because I am the person that brings light. Like that was my shift from why me to I am the light that I was the person who knew how to do CPR, 
I was the person who knew what to do in that situation, and that has been my pattern, and that's the shift. Thank you. <laughs> I know. Is it two different things? I'm going to...